Hi everyone, this is Nil Audrey. Welcome to session seven of Project Management Professional Training. So let's uh, dive in into session seven. In this, uh, in a particular lesson, we are going to talk about uh, the planning stage and step into the processes and what happens exactly in project planning and also try to understand what exactly is project scope. All right. So again, going back to the one of the uh, slides, which I keep on showing almost on every lesson, just to give you a kind of a flashback about how the conventional waterfall uh, project management processes happen. And we are kind of done with the initiation stage. We have gone through the project charter, business case. We have also seen how the stakeholder management happens. Uh, we are again going to come back to the initiation stage once we talk about the integration uh, knowledge area. So remember that integration knowledge area is the only area which cuts across all the five process groups. The remaining of the nine, uh, the nine uh, you know, KVs or the KAs, which we call the knowledge areas, they are not spanning through all the five uh, process groups. They are going through either uh, you know, starting from planning and completing at monitoring control or completing at closing. So once the initiation is done, then we are getting into the planning stage, right? And the planning stage is, is one of the most, I will say the fat layer of the conventional waterfall model, because here we give a lot of time to plan. And if you are planning it correctly, then only the execution and the monitoring control all will happen smoothly. Compared to Agile, we are not spending too much time into planning in Agile because we are breaking down. We are in an adaptive approach. We are, we are more into a kind of a flexibility format. Like we know a couple of the points of the product backlog. Uh, and from there we start off. And then as, as we get into sprint after sprint, uh, we either uh, go back to the backlog, we reprioritize that, or we add new items or new features into the backlog, but not in the waterfall. Waterfall means the conventional where scope is constant. So planning is one of the areas where a project manager uh, will spend a good amount of time to ensure that uh, all the things and what are the things are we are going to check in the next slides okay and all the things are kind of planned well and the aim of planning is that you get a solid project plan document with you okay now uh this slide is one of the most important slides just to, so just have a screenshot of this it gives you quickly an idea that what are the knowledge areas which are cutting across so if you look into planning you will see that Integration is, of course, going through all of them, and I have not touched that yet. That's one of the last topics, one of the core areas, or uh, one of the key uh, you know, reason for a project manager to exist is uh, the integration, right? Because integration is the area where the project manager will will blend all the all the uh, knowledge areas and will uh, you know will have the expertise to ensure that everything has been blended well and uh, then only he can say that i have integrated all the substances from uh, initiating till closing but apart from integration if you look then you will see that in the planning we have got scope schedule cost quality resource communication risk procurement and stakeholders all of them are falling under planning right now each of them needs some time to, to have a grip on that and to, to, to know what they are, okay? Now from PMP exam in a perspective, okay? At least uh, a few of them should be at the back of your hand. I mean, you, you should be, or you must be knowing all of them, uh, but few of them must be like you have mastered them. And those are scope, time or schedule, okay? Scope, time, cost, and uh, risk. Okay, these are the uh, you know four ones which are absolutely key factors to pass in the PMP, and absolutely uh, the last one as well, which we started in the initiation phase, uh, that is called the stakeholder management. Okay, so if you are hundred percent sure what is scope, how to uh, you know derive the schedule or the time of the project, how to derive the cost or the budget of the project, um, you know how to go about and uh, manage the risk throughout. Um, and how to manage the stakeholders, you kind of are into the bracket of a solid PM. And you are you are there in the in the uh, bracket of uh, 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 passing, you know, uh, uh, option or the or or the chances of your of your scores to getting passed in the exam gets high. Okay. So planning stage is the only stage where things are going in a proper order. 
Okay, you might say that in the initiation stage also, we are going with the business case and then charter, and then probably we are getting into the stakeholder management. Fine. Uh, if you get into execution or monitoring control, things might not be in an exact order. Okay, but planning stage is one of the stages where things must be in an exact order. And I will show you that order, what exactly will the detailed order step there. But as of now, now focus on the basic part. What are the important things which happen in the planning? Now, first thing which I said, like, you know, fail to plan is plan to fail. So in a conventional project, a PM will give a lot of time in developing the planning and the outcome of the planning stage is that you're going to have a formal project plan document with you, which is signed off by all the key stakeholders. Now you might say that in CIS, we are not doing that, right? For day one project launches or for day one uh, or day two site launches, are we getting into a project plan, which is signed off by all the people? No, we are not doing that. And the reason is that, yes, we are working in a different culture in a different way. And most of the things are already set, like the cost is set. Uh, we already know the defined standard timelines to launch an MDF for an IDF for a PBS. So they are like kind of defined, right? So we don't really have to bother if you're a delivery TPM, you don't have to bother much about um, what the schedule, or what's the cost um, or what's the scope because they all are defined. If something is non-standard, then yes, of course you are going to uh, you know, do some kind of brainstorming and work with the SMEs to ensure that you get a proper um, you know, plan on that. But apart from that, uh, most of us, most of the projects that we deal with day in, day in and day out, they're all pretty much like known things. Like they are, they are standard, they are having a run book, all the activities are documented. So it's not like anything is a surprise there, right? But think of it, if you ever have worked into a service company, like I used to work for IBM uh, some eight years back. Now, when I was in IBM, then that point of time, I was serving for a client called uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, okay? And that was kind of a huge program. I, I will say close to 40 PMs were working in that. It was a three year long program with multiple phases. And uh, I cannot like disclose the work there because that's a client specific thing. But all I want to say is that it is so crucial that IBM or any of these like companies, like service companies, they are going to sign a contract with the client. So in this case, say Royal Bank of Scotland and in the contract, it will be specifically mentioned that this is the end date of the project, okay? After three years or whatever. And if that end date is missed by the delivering company like IBM for any reason, okay? Then for each day, a penalty has to be paid by IBM to Royal Bank of Scotland for the delay. So look at the criticality. I mean, we cannot think of it or compare that with a CIS project where we are saying that, okay, certain risk is there, let's re-baseline, right? Uh, uh, so, so we do not have any option in those kind of uh, projects with a client or external clients where there is a dollar value um, and we do not have the luxury of rebaselining the project. So I'm talking about those kind of projects where uh, dollar value is involved with the client and the parent company. Okay. Uh, and also when you are working for IBM or those kind of companies, then you will be getting a project ID code. And every week you have to uh, submit a worksheet with the, with the particular project ID code. Um, and then only, uh, you know, your salary will be processed because your salary though it's coming from IBM, but basically uh, the expense is being going to the client. Again, you are not at all a contract employee here. I mean, I'm talking about a proper permanent employee of IBM who was working for a client. So it's a very common culture that, that everything has to be very meticulously done and everything has to be signed off and things has to be planned out well in advance with some buffers because you never know, right? If something goes wrong, uh, then also as per the contract, we have to meet the contract. So contractual obligation is a very, very critical thing. So you cannot just compare that with a CIS standard project where things are pretty much like more, I will say, uh, more kind of known thing, more relaxed, I will say. The customers are internal. Uh, of course, we have got our own challenges. We have got CS sites and so on. But still, I will say, uh, the contract is not signed. And it's all about, you know, how you take it, whether whether how you can trade off between a business request versus uh, your own resources and, you know, let's say a hardware delivery, like, like, delay is going to happen, then how are you going to manage that and all, right? But it's definitely not 
uh, to be compared with a company where we have got the culture to work for a different client on a contract. So those kind of companies, they all have got a very meticulous way of uh, doing the stuff and most of them follow the PMP process quote by quote. Okay, so planning means that you're developing a scope. So scope has to be developed, schedule has to be developed, cost has to be developed. And you will see that a certain of the uh, statements I have marked in red. Why? Because these are the critical things. If these things are not done, then your project plan is definitely not completed. Okay, quality standards has to be given. What kind of quality management or assurance you are doing? So quality assurance will be done in the uh, planning stage and then quality control will be coming in the monitoring control stage. We'll come to that in detail, right? The communication, what kind of communication are you going to roll up? Are you going to give a weekly uh, report, a status report to people or maybe a VP kind of a, a report on a monthly basis or maybe four or five kinds of you know, reports are to be rolled out for different segments of people or the stakeholders. Okay, how do you engage with these stakeholders? Are you going for an on-site visit to meet face-to-face -face, or are you meeting them over, let's say, uh, in a video call or you're going to talk over phone or are you working on the same office? All those kinds has to be sorted out, okay? And that's why in the projects where you see mostly the service companies, uh, their project managers, they also travel a lot because uh, a part of the travel is a part of the budget as well, which is paid by the client. That, okay, a PM has to travel to certain locations to probably uh, you know, check the status of the data centers or meet with the key stakeholders, meet with the project sponsor or the delivery manager from the client and, and so on, right? Risk management, one of the core areas of PM. I mean, I will personally say that if you are not good are solid in risk management, then you are not a solid PM, okay? So risk management is something, again, that has to be started in the planning. A certain amount has already been done in the project charter, right? If you remember the project charter, we already uh, bulleted out the high level risk there, right? But apart from that, I will say identification of the risk, analysis of the risk, response strategy, okay? All those things has to be documented, risk register has to be developed, so all that happens in the planning stage. Procurement strategy. Definitely, if you are going to procure some hardware or some resources, right, uh, from some other, uh, you know, service-based companies, then you have to have that strategy, what kind of procurement you want to do, what kind of manpower you need, how many hours you want to spend, and so on and so forth. And that all will be very helpful for you because in the planning, if you finish off all this creation of the master document or the master service, uh, you know, documents or the agreement with the uh, vendors and the uh, channel partners, then it's very, very easy to you know, release the purchase order and get the job done, right? Uh, finally, once all the key components are done, then you will be developing your project management plan, signed off by key stakeholders along with the baselines. Now, what is a baseline? I will come to that in the very next slide, okay? And for the exam purpose, just know that once your planning is completed, then the PM holds a full-blown kickoff meeting with all the stakeholders. There can be numerous meetings in between because planning is an iterative process. You cannot just say that, okay, I derived the scope now, all signed off, great, now get into schedule. It doesn't happen like that. Okay, I will, sh I will tell you slowly how it happens, but, but once all the things are being documented and you have reached the final PM plan, all is signed off, then you get into a kickoff meeting. You want to address all these stakeholders saying that this is the project plan, which will be shared to you or kept in a shared folder somewhere where you all can access, but I'm going to take you through it right now in this one hour or two hour meeting and any questions are welcome. So that's called a kickoff meeting. So don't confuse a kickoff meeting with, which we normally do, right? We 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 do the kickoff in the beginning of the project. And many people do that. There is nothing wrong with that. But uh, from the exam point of view, always know that there can be many meetings prior to the kickoff meeting, but the kickoff meeting happens only after one thing, once the planning uh, document is being formalized. All right, now let's talk about baselines. But before that, we are stepping into scope now, right? So. It's a big thing because we have came a long way, right? We started with the fundamentals of project management and then we got into certain things like what is stakeholder and got into different kind of companies, uh, different kind of organization structures uh, and so on. And then we stepped into initiation and now into planning and we are finally getting into one of the key baselines, which is scope. Now, always know that 
a conventional project management model, like a waterfall model, okay? Once we get into Agile, I will talk about that as well and I will compare this. But waterfall know that waterfall has got a definition of baselines or what we say, we are having three key baselines in waterfall model. And that's those baselines are typically called the triple constraints. And what those baselines are, scope, cost, and time. Okay, these are the rigid baselines which you can say, and you have to define them in the planning stage and you have to get them all signed off. Uh, your entire scope is being defined there. Your entire cost of the project is defined there and your entire schedule is being defined there. Okay, and, and these, you, you can think them as the boundaries. Now, as you increase them, because in between uh, you are seeing the word like quality, right? So as you increase, let's say you, make the triangle more broader, which means more time, more cost, so on, right? Uh, that that will actually mean the more cost you spend, the more time you spend, the more quality will be also be deeper, right? But, but you have to draw a balance there. That's why we call that keep the sides of the triangle uh, equilateral, okay? Make it like a 60 degree kind of a triangle looking like that. As much as the scope degree is there as much as cost as much as time and that's when the quality will be well rounded uh, there is no point in spending too much cost or too much time uh, just to ensure that we are having higher quality so pmi calls this gold plating gold plating means that uh, you are trying to add more buffers into a project be it in terms of schedule maybe one work can be done in five days you're putting that in 10 days or one work will cost you hundred dollars you're placing like two hundred dollars so these kind of stuff in pmi is called gold plating and gold plating is not encouraged at all in pmi okay things should be as accurate as possible of course with some kind of contingency in the back end but definitely like not a huge gold plating that you are just multiplying things into two and keeping them as a reserve that is not a good project management uh, narrative. Now, when I talk about baselines in waterfall, always think about scope, time, cost. These three are the baselines, okay? Now, what does it mean? Um, let us say that the project is running, okay? While the project is running, you get a scope change. It keeps on happening. Like in CIS, we, we keep on getting, right? You, while the project is happening, uh, you know, a, a scope might get changed. You add, maybe you add more stuff into that. More cameras has to be added, let's say. Uh, and and then then you add more cameras and you find, you, you, you kind of find out like if I add more cameras, will it lead to, uh, you know, more cost, which will cross the budget of the project, uh, which will increase the schedule of the project? Will I be able to meet my day one launch? With the, ad, with the ad of the uh, new cameras or whatever is there. So new scope always leads to this kind of analysis. Now, in a typical service-based company where they are working completely on the PMP uh, notion, what they do, they have got a change control board. I mean, change control board is almost in every company, uh, but change control board functions in a different way in many companies. But what I have like witnessed is that in service companies, uh, the change control board is kind of the board which will decide a change has to take place or not to take place. See, when somebody in in CIS in a day one, uh, you know, site launch, if someone is telling you that we need more cameras, some X, Y, Z reasons are there, uh, uh, probably you just have to have a discussion with your internal stakeholders, right? With the business that it may lead to one week more time. It may lead to one more purchase order. It may lead to one more LVC purchase order, like that kind of stuff. But but then you decide it based on the discussion with your key stakeholders. It can be your manager and the, and the graph there and the security and the business. And if they all say, yes, we are okay to hold on for one more week, you go ahead. Right? But here I'm talking about a fully contractual based project where both the parties have signed off, right? And there is a penalty if there, if there is a delay. So if there is a change in the baseline, okay, or if there is a if if there is a request for change which can impact any of the three baselines, which can be scope, time, or cost, then the change management board may not approve it. But if it's really needed, really, really needed, then what they will do. The, the the approach has to be given to the project sponsor and the sponsor has to say yes to that. If the sponsor says yes, so mostly what happens from your exam point of view also know that 
uh, if a change request is coming, which is going to impact any of the three baselines, uh, then it needs the approval from a sponsor. Okay. So the sponsor has to sign it off. In the case of a service company, the sponsor will be from the client end who is going to spend for the project. The sponsor says, okay, I'm, I'm fine with this deal. Okay, I'm signing off. That's going to override the contract because I've signed it off. And then it's fine. Then that change will be taken. Otherwise, that change will be rejected or placed in a project two for the next phase. Okay, something which is really, really to be done at that point of time. Sometimes some critical talks has to be done. Like let's say uh, car manufacturing, okay, maybe at the end of the, like they are done with the prototype and all is almost over and then they are hearing some new emission standards have come up and they have to add it to the car or it will be a compliance problem. So compliance is something which companies cannot deny. They have to obey that, right? Then you have to halt it, pause it, and sponsor has to probably step in sign off to the agreement and the car launch can be delayed, but they have to step back, roll back and do, do certain things to ensure that emission standards are met in the new engine and then only the car will be rolled out. But sometimes things may not be so critical. It may not be compliance, maybe a design change or maybe something else. And that point of time, they may say, okay, this is coming in the next version of the car. Okay, 2023, this version goes up, 2024, uh, Q1, the next car comes into the pipeline and that will be having this new, uh, voice control command system, which is now with the, like with the peers. Okay. So that's about the triple constraints. Now, that's why I said that when you are planning to become a solid PM or planning to have a full control or full grasp of the PMP knowledge, that ensure that you have got solid knowledge in scope, cost, and time. You should be knowing not only scope, but how scope is derived. You should not only be knowing what is cost, but how cost is derived and how time or the schedule is derived and how they are being connected with each other. Okay. All right. So planning stage, what are we doing with scope? So first of all, what is scope, right? Scope is whatever the work. So there are two kinds of scope. One is called the product scope. One is called the project scope. Okay. So product scope is mainly the scope of the entire product, mainly for the product based companies where they're releasing a product the product itself will be having a scope, right? Um, but scope is something, the project scope is something which we are really keen to know. So project scope is something which is the entire work or all the work which is being done by the project team to deliver the product of the project. Have you got that point? So every project will be, have a, will, will be having a deliverable product your CIS day one launch will be having a deliverable, like a day one site launch. The site will be ready IT infrastructure wise, right? So that is your deliverable. That's your product, which you're giving out to customer like Graph. So uh, whatever work you and your entire project team has done in that life cycle, from initiation till closing, uh, whatever work you have done, to ensure the deliverables are being shared to the customer, that entire work is called the scope of the project. Okay, so that's about the scope. Now, during planning stage, if you go back to this uh, diagram, you will see quickly. I will show you. See, in the in the planning, we have got scope, schedule, cost. We are not having anything to do with anything. We are not touching the scope, cost, schedule, and cost in the execution stage. Why? Because execution stage is the stage where you execute things as per the plan. There you don't touch scope. There you don't go, go back to the drawing board and you derive the scope because that will be like a very wrong way of doing project management. It's a failure. So your scope, schedule, and cost will not be touched in the execution. However, if a change request comes from someone, maybe a key stakeholder or any stakeholder, then it has to go through change control board. And that's the point in the monitoring and control section, you will see that you, you have got the scope, schedule and cost standing again. So scope, schedule and cost will be monitored. If any variance is there, what is the impact is there? That monitoring will be done. Like, are we doing everything to meet the scope? Are we working as per schedule? Are we working within the cost? That will be checked in the monitoring and control. But Execution, we are not going to touch anything with scope, schedule, and cost. We'll just work as per the plan. I hope it is clear, right? So let's come down to planning stage. So planning stage, the first part is that we collect the requirements. We go to our customers, our key stakeholders, and we collect the requirements. If you are in a day one uh, CIS launch, 
probably if you are a part of the intake team, then we can think that, yes, you are going to your customers. Maybe you want to capture the requirements of a new lab they want to form, and then you capture the requirements there, right? Once you capture all the requirements, okay, then you define the scope that, okay, I have got so many requirements from the customer. Uh, then I have to check what are the things that we can do and we cannot do. Sometimes a customer may be asking for the moon and the sun, which you cannot provide within the budget, which you have got. Then you have to consolidate and find out what is the scope that I, would, I can give to customer right now, right away uh, within this day one launch. And probably after the day one, we can look into certain things again, if that can be done in the future or as a phase two kind of thing, right? So you define the scope for the project. And the last piece, you create the work breakdown structure, which we call the WBS. Now, WBS, if you want to say that, what is that one thing I would like to learn from scope and carry it in, into my real project management uh, professional life, that will always be WBS. Work breakdown structure is one of the solid, uh, you know, key component of scope in the planning stage. Uh, WBS, I will be taking a separate session. So lesson number eight, I will focus completely on WBS, what it is, how to break down, and we'll do a hands-on on that as well. But as of now, just know that WBS is nothing but your decomposition of the work. Okay, so let's say you have got a certain work and to um, uh, to 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 uh, you know uh, build a particular. Uh, you know, uh, application or to release an application rather, then you will be having a certain stuff to be done. The application to be hosted on a server. So you build a server first, you get the licenses, then you get the DNS done, you, you get the middleware components done, and then finally you get the application hosted, you do the testing and you run it all. So all those activities which you mark out, you break it down, that is called the work breakdown structure. An example will be if you look into your work front, okay, and there, if you find, let's go to MDF template. And there, if you see all the tasks which are there, like task number one to task number, I think 100 or 100 plus, whatever it is there, all those activities, okay? Uh, if you add all those activities like together, okay? Uh, that is your complete scope of the work, right? And all those activities which are listed, that is that is actually called your work breakdown structure. You're, you're breaking down the work into multiple activities at multiple levels. I will come to that in detail, okay, in the next session. But as of now, just know that when you are breaking down into your work into doable work, like I want to have this website launched, that's the end goal, but that's not the doable work. The doable work can be like, I want to first of all build a server, a physical server or a VM server. Then probably I have to do X item, then Y item, then, you know, one by one, step by step, you go and finally you say, I hosted the website and I got it launched today and the UAT is done. So all those all those manageable, doable steps that you break down the entire project scope is called work breakdown structure. So your client may be telling you many things. I want to get a lab with XYZ items. You break it down. That's why we, we used to have, or we are, we are currently having a very good sheet where we capture all the, uh, all the inputs from the customers. Let, let, so let's say a lab, and then we break it down, right? How do we how do we create this for the customer? Again, for a CIS perspective, like I said, most of the things will be kind of repeatable things. We have done that in the past. We will be doing that in the future as well. Okay, things may not change so much. But again, when we are talking from a client perspective, a service provider company, uh, it may be a very new kind of a project given to the company. And then, then you have to know how to break it down properly. So a good project manager should always be knowing how to break down a project scope into manageable, doable activities. Okay, because if you can do that, then that, that will again connect with your schedule because your schedule also means what? How many resources you need and how many manpower or man hours you need. And, and if you can uh you know do your schedule well you will immediately know the cost as well because uh if you know how many man hours you need and how many man you need basically so with that you 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 can derive the factor that okay how many what's the cost per man per man or per hours okay and then you can at least find out the manpower cost on the project and then you can also find out the hardware cost on the project so cost has got many components we'll come to that later but what i'm trying to say is that uh, if you can break down your scope nicely in an intelligent way, 
then it will have a very good um, impact when you are going to build your schedule and consequently and consequently your uh, cost. Okay. So these things are done in the planning stage for the scope. So what are the things which we are doing in the monitoring and controlling stage? Because we saw that in the chart, right? In the monitoring and control also, we have got scope, time and cost being marked. So there we just validate and control the scope. As a PM, you will check that there is no scope creep, there is no scope deviation. We are working to meet the scope. We are not getting into any direction which is not meeting the scope. We are not doing any, any other bells and whistles which is not meeting the core scope of the project. We are working as per the, the, the final, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the final like, objectives which we are going to share with the customer okay and and also we are having in our mind about the acceptance criteria from the customer standpoint so basically the deliverables which you're giving out to the customer that should always be plugged in your mind that this is the scope that we're working on in the monitoring and control so validate and check validate and check if a real kind of a change a genuine like request comes up which is like change the scope because without this we cannot do this then you have to give it to the change control board. And if it's really going to impact the baselines, it will go to the project sponsor. But most of the time, know this also, most of the time the project manager himself or herself is a part of the change control board. If they are senior PMs, they will be a part of the change control board. I will tell you what a change control board is a very nice way in any company um, to handle change request, to, to stop scope creeps. Um, and to also ensure uh, that the project is not bombarded by, um, you know, just unrealistic changes in the middle of the project. Okay. All right. Now, initially I told you, what is the output of all this? Like what, like what is the thing that we are trying to do in the planning stage with the scope? In the planning stage, we are trying to develop the scope baseline. We are trying to develop the scope baseline, the schedule baseline, the cost baseline, and all these baselines will be added to the project management plan, which is the final output of the planning stage. So three steps just to break it down. How do we reach the baseline scope? Okay, if I say this is my baseline, this is the scope that I have to work on, uh, then, then how do we reach there? One is you capture the requirements from your stakeholders and customers, okay? Once you capture the requirements, from there you have to define the scope. Probably you have to cut and trim some of the requirements because you cannot take all of them into that scope because your schedule will not allow that or your cost will not allow that. But you define the scope after you capture all the requirements from the customer. Once the scope is being captured and once the scope is being defined, Okay, uh, then you, you you will be having a having a double check with the customers again. This is what the defined scope is there, and then you roll out something called a project scope statement. Okay, a project scope statement will be a formal uh, like definition of the scope of the project. So if you are building a server, it should go down to the exact OS, exact firmware version, whatever is needed for that particular server to the exact dotted value. So everything should be so crystal clear in the waterfall model that you know everything what has to be done. There is no unknowns, no surprises for you. The scope is extremely well-defined, okay? Now, once you derive the project scope statement, okay, then you are going to add it along with the work breakdown structure. And there is also something called a work breakdown structure dictionary. A dictionary is something like a glossary kind of thing. There will be certain terms in the WBS which may not be understandable to people who are reading because they are new terms or terms specific to that project. So a dictionary is being developed, kind of a one or two page kind of a glossary where, where key definitions of terms are given. And, and, and from there, 
a reference point or a reference guide, which you can say, right? Uh, if you have seen our job leveling guidelines, a few of the keywords are like defined on the bottom, right? What is What does this mean? You know, force multiplier and all those stuff, right? So basically, similarly, a WBS plus a WBS, you know, dictionary, these two will be added with the project scope statement, and that will be your scope baseline. Okay, so once again, you capture the requirement from the customers or stakeholders, you define the scope, and you roll out or you write down a formal project scope statement. Okay, there are many templates there, but you can use your own way to write it down. Uh, and then you have to also create the WBS and the WBS in a dictionary. All these three in a package is combined called the scope baseline. That is called the perfect scope baseline. And as a PM, you are expected to create that. Okay. Um, most of the time, a PM alone can do this. But I mean, uh, with the help of the stakeholders, of course, at times the PM can already have a kind of a team with them, okay? Uh, though the team acquiring or the team uh, actually comes into picture in PMP in uh, execution stage. In ex execution stage is the stage where you, you know, develop or you hire the team. But in real life, in planning stage, the PM will be having a team, at least few of them will be there. And with the help of the team also, you can, do all the brainstorming and do all the capture of all the items and create this, show it to your stakeholders and ensure that this is the correct one. Nothing has been missed out. Okay, so that's about the three steps. Now we'll go one by one. We'll check what happens in the collect requirements and what are the components of the project scope statement. Um, but again, uh, for the WBS, I would like to do a separate session because like I said, it needs more time and it's good to spend some more time, at least an hour on WBS to understand what it is, how do we do that? And a little bit of hands-on on that. So requirement gathering. Now, first of all, if you remember in the project charter, we did have a certain part of the project objective, right? So certain part of the scope or the requirement of the project was already there in the project charter. So from there, the PM can take or scoop out a certain part of the scope. The scope will not be extremely well defined there. I mean, the objective of the project will be written there, but the scope not be written in the exact, uh, like I said, the server and the firmware versions and all that. But at least the PM will be having a context of the, uh, of the uh, requirement of the project. Similarly, if you remember when we were doing the initiation stage and I spoke about the stakeholder register, uh, when you are developing the register of the stakeholders and doing the one is to ones with them or interviews with them, uh, you also have got a column like requirements from stakeholder. Now, a requirement from stakeholder is also a requirement of the project, right? Again, like I said, you will not be taking all the requirements into the scope, okay, because some some of the stakeholders will be having some very tall you know, requirements which you cannot meet within your agreed budget and timeline with the client. But what I said is that that, that particular you know, register will also give you a lot of information or input into your capturing of requirements, right? And finally, your OPA, if your organization has done in the past similar kind of projects, historic projects like developing uh, uh, servers and all that for for banking institutions or all that, then 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 uh, uh, you can look into uh, those projects, those OPA documents, and from there also you can find out a lot of inputs which can help you to capture the requirements. Okay. Now this is about from where you can get the inputs. Like before, even you uh, uh, you know uh, reach out to the various uh, uh, to 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 the various like concerned parties. Like you can go back to the charter go back to the register or while you're developing the register, you can check into uh, each of the stakeholders and find out what the requirements are and also check in the backend, the OPA, which is already there with the organization. Now, PMI says that every of these processes will be having an input, a tool and technique and output. Like if I go back to the last slide, you will see the defined scope, the output is project scope statement, right? Now, uh, in between the output and the input, there is something called tools and technique. So what are the tools and techniques which is used by a project manager to ensure that he is reaching the correct project scope statement, right? He'll be doing brainstorming. Okay, brainstorming is hearing out ideas. Uh, idea can be 
completely uh, you know apt one or may not be a good one but that's okay any idea is a good idea we say and look and and hearing out the ideas from the different members of the other team somebody will come up with another idea so like that it's it's a good rolling session which happens and ideas can be captured brainstormings are normally done for products and not for not for a very uh, water model kind of projects okay interviews absolutely should be done okay personally i say that when you are involved in a very large complex project um then you should be doing a one is to one or a face to face with your key stakeholders to ensure what they want again this may not be uh too much relevant to your CIS because I said the scope is constant. You know what has to be done, uh, but yes, if if it's a if it's a non-standard kind of requirement, then definitely I will say, do a a face-to-face -face or in person or a phone or video call or interview kind of thing with the uh, particular stakeholder or the end user. Focus groups where you are doing interviews not with all the stakeholders but with the SMEs just with the subject matter expert or few chosen people from the audience who knows about the subject. From there, you will be getting a little more solid input. If somebody is very much good in data center, uh, so they have worked on that for quite some time and you are, your new project is on, a, on, on the build or on the migration of a data center to cloud, that point of time, you can probably go to SME group, right? Uh, and the last part is uh, voting. Voting also is to be done. So voting is normally not done for waterfall, again, for agile, when you are voting for a particular feature of a product. And based on the majority of the voting, you probably uh, keep that feature on the list or you prioritize that feature or do you prioritize that feature, okay? There are many other ways of techniques, like affinity diagram is there uh, and so on and so forth. I will I will you know, request you that um, from the hard, copy book, which is your reference point, go through them and all the tools and techniques which you see for the requirement gathering. There are at least 10 of them. I just flagged a few of them here. Uh, it's good to know them because few of the questions in the exam can be can be pretty much like, you know, asking a very simple question about brainstorming or focus group or affinity diagrams. And you should be knowing the difference between each, each one of them. Okay. All right. Now, once you have done um, the requirement capturing and definition of the scope along with the usage of the proper tools and technique, then you are going to deliver or develop the project scope statement. Now, project scope statement will be having certain content which must be there, okay? Number one, the project scope, of course, the scope which you got, uh, the definition of the scope is coming up there. The deliverables, the exact deliverables the client needs. I need 30 VMs with this configuration in this time, okay? That is the deliverables. Acceptance criteria. So the delivery service manager from my team, I mean, from the client's team will be doing a check for three days, regression testing and so on. And we have to pass at least 95% of the test or 100% of the test, right? So those criteria has to be exactly written what the client needs. Assumptions and constraints. What are the assumptions you are doing in the beginning of the project? There will be many assumptions which you will be doing in the beginning of the project, right? Um, that that your 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 servers will reach on time. There will be no hardware delivery delay. Uh, you will be getting your certificates rolled out on time and some constraints as well. So all has to be again jotted down in the project scope statement. A few of the inputs can already be got from the project charter. Charter itself has got a section called assumptions and constraints, but that's a very initial stage of the project and things are not well fleshed out. So during planning, you will be getting a chance to talk with all the, all the people, stakeholders, SMEs, and you will be having more fair idea about different kinds of assumptions and constraints which you are going to face in the project. And finally, what is not part of the project? Maybe you will not write this in the project scope statement, but you have to know it very well that this is not part of the project. And at times, this has to be documented as well, like uh, just to ensure the client do not expect this from you. So maybe a certain thing is there, like the user testing, the last end you user testing, the client has to do it. Uh, the client should not expect that probably your team is going to do it because the client's team has agreed to get the UAT done from their end. So it has to be done from their end itself. And this is not a part of the project plan. Okay, so project scope statement should be very clear in section wise and defined timelines, defined valuables or variables should be written there, uh, which will not be changed in the future. Okay, these are all frozen in the beginning. Okay, 
So with that, we came to um, uh, the the end of the lesson seven. Uh, and in the lesson eight, I'm going to take you through the WBS. Let's have a quick uh, check in on the lesson seven again, a quick wrap up. Uh, project scope, we have seen what is that, is all the work done by the project team to deliver product of the project. Okay, triple constraints, scope, time, and cost with the quality in between. And we have to ensure that the triangle is a equilateral triangle. Um, what is your scope baseline? It's basically your project scope statement plus WBS plus WBS dictionary. All right, with that, we came to the end of the session. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you liked the session and watch out for lesson eight where we're gonna talk about WBS. Thanks again, cheers.